one of the best laparoscopic surgeons in Spain and probably in Europe, and he's contributed a lot to the literature in a lot of different fields. Um, one of the nicest studies on comparing open versus laparoscopic colon resections. And I asked him to talk a little bit about the sleeve because we hear a lot about the sleeve and it's a fairly simple operation, but when it goes bad, there's not a lot of worse operation. Thank you very much, Alphonse, for your kind invitation to move. I have nothing to disclosure. Okay, I think everybody knows about the origin of the of the sleeve gastrectomy, and I think I have the privilege to to say thanks to Michel Gagné. We discuss a lot about this technique, and I learn a lot. And that is probably the reason because one one is the um, increasing operation that normally we do, at least in my hospital in Spain and Europe. You know the surgical technique. We can change those uh, small holes for a simple hole in the, in, the, in the belly button. However, you have to take a, a, in account about this uh, beautiful and easy operation can have a lot of problems, the most important, if you have a leak in the upper part of the, of the stomach, we will come on later. Our indication for the sleep is a, is a secondary procedure or maybe a primary, but. Mm, it's normally secondary in patients with a super obese BMI more than 60. Patients with more comor multiple comorbidities, I'm talking about uh, elderly patients with uh, a classification of anesthesiology three and four. It's sometimes extensive uh, previous surgery. Patients with uh, IBDs or patients' preference in a lower BMI. That is not a consensus that is not my uh, phrase, but there are some surgeons trying to promote this surgery in uh, uh, these uh, patients. Well, however, what do you think about, you know, this sleeve gastrectomy? It's a changes in gastrointestinal transit. There are some uh, um, uh, um, papers published in literature are contradictory, you know better than me. It's, of course, it's a restrictive procedure, but we demonstrated, and many people demonstrated, our hormonal changes, and in proof, we have excellent results, at, at least in type 2 diabetes. Thus, I think it's a, uh, it's a uh, recently paper published in Annals of Surgery, that is the anti-diabetic effect on hormonal changes in laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. You know, we have to, but uh, we have to uh, think about that is a, not a simple restrictive procedure. At least with our three years follow-up, we, we can compare those results of the sleeve gastrectomy patients with our same group of patients with a gastric bypass. That is the different anatomical bypass of the duodenum. Probably is not the only thing to necessary to improve or to cure the, the glucose tolerance, at least in our patients. And that is our series. We have started in 2003, and now in 2009, last year, we did uh, almost 100 patients. In our hospital, we operate between 325 and 350 patients per year. That is not a high number comparing with the United States, but I promise you in Spain it's a very, very uh, high number. The reason, because we improved from, I think the normal is the 60s to last year, 93, is because we are a referral center, many people are sending patients with uh, comorbidities or, or even higher BMIs. You can have here, you know, the BMI is between 37 and 82. And uh, that the results in terms of the, of the BMI and, and excess weight are similar, at least uh, in a follow-up of two years, comparing with uh, a gastric bypass. And I think it's important to go to the, to the literature and remember the, the two international consensus performed by, uh, by Michel Gagné 
in the in the in the past, and I think it's really important because it's a simple technique. But many people is discussing about where is the best uh, surgical technique for this, and they discuss about from the technique to the hormones. What about complications? In uh, postoperative complication, the most important complication is the is the leak. We have, uh, in our uh, experience, we have eight patients and, and they send three patients from other hospital. We have an experience of leak of 11 patients. We have a bleeding six patients, wound infection in, in the extraction uh, stomach uh, wound, uh, only two cases. We have thrombosis, we have two pneumonias. I think it's another, the most important I will talk about is the leak and the late complications. That is a, uh, is a similar because it's, uh, again, it's more than 250 patients with a medium follow-up more than a year by a group of Greece by Emmanuel Leandros. And you can see the leak is almost uh, 4%. It's, uh, you know, it's not bad, but the problem of those patients we will discuss later is an in really important complication. Again, we can divide it, you know, the leak, the dilatation of the remaining stomach, sometimes esophageal dysmotilities such as uh, previous speaker coming in, in banding, and symptoms of regurgitation of, or reflux. That, I think, is an excellent systematic review published in SORT in the last year with more than uh, 2,000 500 patients, uh, two randomized trial, and there are uh, 13 in high-risk patients and 24 as a primary operation. That is improving probably thanks to the, to the consensus of this uh, technique. There are only three multicentric and 33 as a single center. If you have, they divided in a high-risk is two-stage patients and primary procedure. If you take a look of this, it's so really, you know, to me, the leak is 1.2% in a high-risk patient as a primary procedure is, is more than double. It's 40, 45 patients in 1,600 patients. It's close, almost 3%. We can discuss later about why they have in uh, probably in, uh, in non-risky patients, more uh, leak than in risky patients. In uh, intraoperative complication, we can discuss about related with the uh, place of the trochas, uh, like uh, hemorrhage, with the pneumoperitoneum to the special, to the exposure. But I think, again, the most important is if you have this figure in a patient with a leak in the postoperative period. That is another patient with one, two, and three leaks referred to our center, and he, uh, she, or oh, sorry, she spent, she's still alive, but she spent six months at the hospital, two months in intensive care unit, you can imagine. Again, uh, we have uh, nine women probably is related because, uh, you know, it's, uh, more women is, are operated with this operation and BMI is uh, close 52%, and the indication for the sleep gastrectomy is BMI, comorbidities, uh, technical difficulties during the operation, probably the liver size, and the age in, uh, in elderly patients. Uh, the mean operative time is, uh, is uh, 70 minutes, no interoperative complication, and time to diagnosis, that is really important, at least for us. Seven patients is in, in, the, in the first seven days of postoperative period, but uh, four patients is more than seven patients. Actually, it's one patient with, uh, with uh, more, you know, you can see here, more than three weeks after the surgery. The first procedure uh, is, uh, is uh, we, you will see later in this uh, table. I think it's important, you know, the majority of patients you know, close 60% is treated uh, by surgery as the at the first procedure. You know, when the patient is, is quite well, you can, you can do a CT scan and drain. 
or to do a, a wall stain or to do a, a nasogastric or nasogestional tube. As you can see, we did so many things, wall stains, processes, even uh, three times, etc. But I strongly recommend the solution for this is not to, take, to waste the time with, with this, is go to the surgery and to put a nasogastric naso or genital tube. Because we are very uh, unlucky with uh, our experience with wall stents, because uh, we have inclusion, as you can see in this specimen here, we have to take out the old stomach and to do a, a, a gastric bypass, but in the esophagus with a total gastrectomy. And uh, uh, you can see also, you know, a patient with two wall stents, and you can see, oh, again, the fistula after six weeks with the stents. The incidence of the, of the leak is probably is around between 2 and 3%, at least in the consensus. And I think it's a quite busy uh, uh, slide. However, I strongly agree with that. It's no place to do a stent in a sleeve gastrectomy with a leak. The majority, they divided in septic and non-septic but the majority is, is treated by surgery or CT scan and drain and to put a patient in a, a nasogestional tube feeding to send a patient with a, with a nasogastric tube, you know, to, 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 for the alimentary uh, the patient. That is another uh, algorithm, therapeutic algorithm uh, proposed by uh, Nicola Basso in Italy but I think is, is uh, probably, uh, we are not uh, absolutely agree on that because they are uh, based in so many different endoscopic procedures like uh, stitches, like uh, glue, like uh, prosthesis. That's uh, at least in our experience has, uh, has been a, 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 bad, a really bad experience. In bleeding, we have intra-abdominal bleeding. We have, you have to remember, you can have bleeding from the stapler line uh, out uh, uh, into the abdomen and also into the, into the uh, stomach. That is the experience of the, of the, um, of the two groups uh, um, in rainforest or no rainforest, and you can see Probably you can discuss about because I think it's too much. The, uh, there are uh, numbers in leak in in patients with no reinforce is absolutely much higher than than patients reinforced. Other problems with this morning we comment. I think it's important to go as quick as possible because that is not really a, a, a tough problem when you do a patient with 150 kilos. When we do a, a patient with more than 200 kilos, you have to prevent the rhabdomyolysis because it could be a very, very important problem. Another problem is a late complication, the stenosis. We have five patients. We did a gastric bypass in three cases. We do a gastrectomy in uh, one case. And in one case, we treat this patient with a wall stent. This patient, we decided to do a total gastrectomy. This patient, we put a wall stent, and after that was very good. Uh, in, and uh, this patient, we decided to do, because it's a gastric bypass, I'm sorry, it's a, a gastric pouch dilatation, we decided to do a gastric bypass. I know you can do a real sleeve, but sometimes real sleeve could be more, even more leak than a simple sleeve. They are the experience of the Belgian group to do in uh, those patients to treat like an achalasia, to do a, a myotomy. And uh, however, unfortunately, we don't have experience. And I think for us is probably another uh, physiopathology of the, um, of the, of the achalasia in this patient. You, you can have this, you know, and you can decide it, what, what is the best probably it's a, a wrong operation performed in the first case. Maybe you can do a rear sleeve or maybe you can go to a, a, a definitive operation like a bypass. 
Mr. Chairman, as uh, my conclusion is, I think laparoscopy is leak gastrectomy is a is a, a good operation for uh, our patients, even uh, to treat type 2 diabetes. However, I think it's not only a simple technique, because when when we have complications such as leak, yeah, they are very very difficult to treat. And uh, I think, uh, I'm sorry for that, to make propaganda, please, uh, the sound. And uh, save the date, because we are waiting for you in, in Barcelona at the end of this year. We will discuss about everything about that. Thank you very much.